Before I start the review, I have a quick correction. In last week's video, and some of you pointed this out in the comments, I came very close to getting Batwoman Bingo for Episode 8 of Season 3, but I didn't because I neglected to check off Kill Me, which you felt I should have done since the episode was absolutely putrid and I even said Kill Me at one point in the video. And the reason I didn't check it off was human error. Kill Me should have gotten a check, I meant to give it a check, but I've been up all night editing, I could barely keep my eyes open, and the video was already late, so it slipped past me, I clicked on render, export, and didn't notice the error until it was too late. But I always try to correct these things whenever I can, so here's what should have happened at the end of the Batwoman Season 3 Episode 8 video. Thanks to everybody who called that out. I might not have noticed otherwise, and then that episode wouldn't have gotten the complete thrashing it so richly deserved. And now, on with the review. I hate this show so much. Look, I know this is the CW we're talking about here, and a CW show is expected to do certain things because of the audience they cater to. But for God's sake, I would think that at some point even horny, stupid, preteen Tumblr fangirls would eventually call bullshit on multiple murders being used as a backdrop for people's infantile f up relationship melodrama. And who knows, if any of those people were still watching this catastrophe of television, maybe they would. But at this stage of the game, I'm pretty sure the only ones left watching are people like me, because people like you won't let me stop. I hope you're proud of yourselves. This episode begins with Poison Ivy using her plant vines to murder two fishermen. Yeah, that'll teach them for... Fishing. Then Ivy walks out of the lake where Montoya runs up to meet her and Ivy says that she thought the water would revive her, but it didn't and she needs to get her strength back. And it's never clear what that even means because she just used her powers and throughout the episode she'll continue using her powers to do some pretty heavy lifting and yet we're supposed to believe that she's in a weakened state. You're telling us one thing and showing us another. We're not even one scene in and the episode already makes no sense. And I'd say it's all downhill from from here, but how can you go downhill when you're starting at the bottom? The answer is, you find a new bottom. And wherever that is, after nearly three seasons, we're still not there. Cut to a graveyard where Ryan talks to her mother's grave, which is suddenly a thing now since the potted plant is gone. Sure, why not? She says her mom was perfect and the most amazing person who ever lived, but Ryan can't get out of her own head right now and wonders, what am I doing wrong? How much time have you got, Ryan? That's not sarcasm. I could list all the things you've done wrong lately, but it's such a long list I'd have to do a whole series of videos on it, and frankly, I don't want to be here all night again. The short version is, you done f***ed up. Cut to Montoya's office, where Luke is doing shirtless chin-ups like he's Oliver f***ing Queen all of a sudden. Oh yeah, that's totally in character for this guy. I'm pretty sure this is the first actual exercise we've ever seen Luke doing. Sophie can tell something's bothering him. Really? What give him away, Sherlock? And she wonders if this has something to do with Marcus. Cut to Jada Jet's office, where John Diggle suddenly shows up, because him and Jada just happen to be old friends. Does that seem so f***ing convenient that it strains credibility? past the breaking point? Yes. Yes, it does. Or it would if the writers hadn't sodomized credibility with a lead pipe and left it for dead about two and a half seasons ago. Back to Ivy and Montoya, where Ivy is very confused because the sunlight should be making her stronger, but for some reason it isn't working. Well, Pam, this is just a guess on my part, but that might have something to do with the fact that the weather is clearly overcast, the sun is hiding behind all those clouds in the sky right now, and that light beam you're standing in is being projected by a sun lamp held by a PA standing about five feet to your left. Come on, we can see the sky is totally gray with clouds. What are they even doing here? So Ivy thinks there's something wrong with her. Well, yeah, I'd say so. Just look at the show you're appearing on right now. But Montoya casually mentions 
questions that this didn't stop Ivy from murdering those two people a few minutes ago. Not that Renee seems terribly bothered by that. Renee remarks that nothing has really changed since they were last together, and Ivy resents that she was left to rot for ten years with no water, no sunlight, and no soulmate, while Renee just felt guilty about it. That must have been really awful for you, she says. I know I've asked this question before, but we still don't have an answer, so I'll ask again. If Poison Ivy didn't have water for ten years, how is she still alive? Yeah, yeah, because the plot says so. F*** you. But both human beings and plants need water to live. Without some kind of H2O to keep you going, eventually your body is going to be as dried out as Caroline Dry's post-Batwoman job prospects. Unless you've got access to a f***ing Lazarus pit, that's not something you come back from. Anyway, playing the guilt card works because Renee then says that she knows how to get Pam's strength back, and considering Pam just casually murdered two people when she wasn't at full strength, Renee helping her with this says something really bad about Renee, and you better get used to that because the writers have only just begun to bury this character in their own shit. Back at Montoya's office, Ryan shows up with coffee for Luke, but not for Sophie, because Ryan figured that acting like a passive-aggressive child felt so good last week, why not just double down on that? I mean, it's not like we've got important grown-up stuff to do right now or anything. They identify some environment-based attacks that have been happening lately, the dead fishermen, a hornet attack at a pesticide factory, an overturned oil rig. Yeah, Poison Ivy can't get her strength back, but she was able to tip over a f***ing oil rig. You figure it out. So Sophie triangulates all the attacks while Luke shows Ryan some science darts he whipped up that'll slow Poison Ivy down. Not that this'll matter because those things never get used. Then Sophie narrows down their target area where Poison Ivy is likely hiding to the National Park. You know, that place where all the plants are. Team Batwoman are detectives. Cut back to Jada explaining the whole situation to Dig, who doesn't have nearly as many questions as I would. Where the shit did that Black Love Society subplot disappear to for starters? She's worried because Marcus will go after his sister when he wakes up. But he won't wake up until they suck the desiccation juice out of him, so they could just not do that. Or they could freeze him, which was their plan before, but is now suddenly no longer an option for reasons unknown. So Jada's in a real bind here. She refuses to not wake up Marcus, but she also refuses to put the murdering sociopath in Arkham because him being a murdering sociopath isn't his fault. Well, that just excuses everything, doesn't it? You know, Jada, there are mental health facilities besides Arkham. With your money and resources, you could easily find the best ones in the world. You could always try putting Marcus in one of those. Really? Not even gonna consider it, huh? Shocking. Dig has the idea that maybe Jada should go back to the source with the Joker's joy buzzer, but she's already done that. And wouldn't you know it, every neurologist Jada's talked to has told her, without ever examining the joy buzzer, mind you, that another jolt from that thing would fix Marcus's brain. Called it? Oh my god, I f***ing knew it. I literally predicted this exact thing would happen. I thought about the stupidest possible way the writers might come up with to fix Marcus, and that was it. Just shock him again. That's all it takes. Because once you drop a bomb, the easiest way to fix all the damage is to just drop another one. Hey, did you know that Batman could have turned the Joker back into Jack Napier by just tossing him into that vat of chemicals a second time? For Christ's sake, if it was that f***ing simple, why not just give Marcus shock? therapy, which, incidentally, Jada, they do it f***ing Arkham! Dig points out that all those Batman villain weapons have been popping up around town lately, so maybe the Joker's buzzer is closer than Jada thinks, so they decide to mosey over to Montoya's office to see what there is to see. Back to Ivy and Montoya. Renee read something somewhere about how plants communicate with each other through acoustics in the ground, which... Might be a thing, but sure sounds like bullshit. And it turns out the cutting that infected Mary did so in order to bring Ivy back to full HP. They just need to draw Mary here. Which Ivy is going to do with... Plant telepathy. Or something.
Cut to an alley in the city where Alice is reading a newspaper article about Poison Ivy being back. She's not happy about this, but keeps the news to herself for now. Then Mary arrives with coffee that she got free of charge thanks to mind control and suggests that they should take a vacation to Santorini, wherever that is. That sounds good to Alice, but then Mary suddenly has some kind of horrible migraine. Plant telepathy? Activate. Then we cut to Team Batwoman driving into the park like the f***ing Griswolds on a camping trip, and Sophie admits that she screwed up with Montoya, trusting her, defending her, screwing her. My bad. But Ryan's still giving Sophie the cold shoulder and starts bitching at her, which distracts them long enough to nearly run a guy over. He's terrified of something and needs help, so Ryan and Luke jump out to assist, and then plant vines grab the car with Sophie inside it. So Sophie grabs the bat suit and jumps out as the vines drag the car away. How plant vines are strong enough to move a f***ing car is anyone's guess, but they do quite easily easily because Poison Ivy is in a weakened state. Then the plant vines come after them. The CG on these things is so f***ing bad, they look like rejected PS2 graphics. They grab the dart gun out of Luke's hands, they impale and kill the guy with no main character shields, so Team Batwoman run for it and take cover in a cabin about 20 yards away. And it's at this point I start wondering two things. One, why didn't Ryan put the bat suit on before they entered the park, for protection if nothing else? And two, why don't they have the Batwing suit? They access the Batcave where the Batwing suit was in the last episode, is the show suggesting that they didn't take it with them when they left? Because if that's what the show is suggesting, that... Sounds like exactly the sort of thing these ass clowns would do. Never mind. Luke is acting very agitated as he tries to barricade the door. Unfortunately, Ryan has to ask him what his deal is. And I say unfortunately because then he tells them what his deal is. Stop me if you've heard this one. Luke thinks this entire mess is his fault. In fact, in reality, he's about the only character whose fault it isn't. But this is Batwoman, and facts and reality have no place here. So this, honest to God, is the bug up Luke's ass. The Batwing suit breaks half the time because of me. No, it doesn't. It breaks because the failsafe is bullshit and doesn't work. The second you turn the failsafe off, the suit operated just fine. We couldn't save Mary from Poison Ivy because of me. Really? Because just last week, you guys were saying that was Ryan's fault. Did you stop at Retcons R Us on your way to the park? A vine snagged the dart gun away because of me. Oh yeah, I'm sure the super-powered supervillain had nothing to do with that. You idiot. My dad knew all along. There was one reason he didn't give me the suit and one reason only. That he didn't want his only son risking his life in a malfunctioning battle suit that clearly didn't have the kinks worked out yet? Because I'm not a hero. So Ryan tells Luke that, you know how you're on the journey to becoming a hero? You fail. I mean, take Sophie for example. Look how much she's been f***ing up lately. What a dumbass. I mean, that shit with Montoya? Freaking Barry Allen would have been impressed with how stupid that was. Sophie is such a goddamn colossal idiot that- And then it goes on like that for a while. And Ryan's certainly not wrong about Sophie being the biggest f*** up in any room that doesn't have Barry Allen in it. Hashtag Sophie sucks at everything. But this is getting a little bit repetitive. And I'm all for the writers calling attention to the fact that Sophie is the paragon of incompetence, but is there any conceivable way that we can do it that doesn't make the whole thing about Ryan just being butthurt because Montoya broke Sophie like a horse before she got a chance to? So Ryan tells Luke to science them a way out of this using only the stuff in the cabin, and while he's being useful to try to save them from this life and death situation, Ryan and Sophie are going to talk about sex without talking about sex. Guess which thing the episode focuses on? Cut back to Ivy and Montoya. Ivy hasn't found Mary yet, and asks Renee how Team Batwoman knew she was here. They figured it out by doing rudimentary detective stuff. Yeah, it surprised the hell out of me too. They start arguing again on account of Batman burying Ivy alive for 10 years, but Renee insists that Ryan isn't Batman. Why she means that as a positive is one of the more 
fucked up things in the episode, but what else is new? Renee wants to talk to Team Batwoman so she can tell them that Pam can change. You know, because murdering two dudes for having the audacity to remove a couple fish from a lake was a sign that Pam wants to change. And Renee will regret what she did to Pam for the rest of her life, but she can't keep going down this path. She just wants things to be normal again so they can leave this city behind. And can't I alone be worth it? Pam kisses her and says, of course she's worth it. And one day, they will leave this city behind. And I guess that eco-terrorism kick Pam has been on will just be a funny story they tell their grandkids. But first, she has to deal with all those pesky people trying to stop her. So she mind controls Renee to stay put and then leaves, saying she's going to kill Batwoman. And after that, we can work on us. I guess the point here is that Poison Ivy is just that far gone. But really, all it's doing doing is making me hate Montoya for freeing her in the first place and allowing all this. At least with Ivy, you can say she's not in her right mind. And also, she's supposed to be a supervillain, so we expect her to act this way. Renee Montoya should f***ing know better. You think I was just blowing smoke last week when I said the show turned her into an irrational jackass? Jesus Christ, just throw her on the pile with all the other characters from the comics these writers have bent over the table and f without lube in the last three years. Dig and Jada show up at Montoya's office. There's a lock on the door, and Dig, the career crime fighter, can't pick the lock, so Jada has to do it for him this show. And inside, they find a list of all the weapons that went missing, and every one of them are crossed off, except the Joker's joy buzzer. Cut to Mary and Alice, and they're on their way out of town when suddenly Mary has another migraine. So they stop the car, and Mary starts bitching at Alice that this bitch of a migraine only stops bitching at her when she goes in that direction like a bitch. Alice thinks Mary going that way would be very bad because of this newspaper article she just read about Poison Ivy being back and having two versions of something probably doesn't end well for one of them. Reference that business back in season one with the other Beth Kane, which I'm honestly stunned the writers remembered. But Mary is like, F that noise. Me and the OG Ivy have a bond and she's the reason I'm finally happy. So, off we go. Back in the cabin, Ryan attempts to make nice and emotionally validate Sophie, but now the passive-aggressive bitch ball has passed to Sophie, who demands to know what Ryan's problem with her is. And if Ryan would just say sexual frustration, we could save ourselves a lot of time, but God forbid anything be that easy on this show. Sophie says this isn't just about the Montoya thing, because Ryan's never liked her. And Ryan claims it goes all the way back to when Sophie thought she was a common criminal, which is bullshit, because they were getting along just fine this season until the Montoya thing happened, so obviously that's what this is about. Eventually, it all devolves into, I don't know if you like me or hate me, Ryan. <laughs> it's two grown-ass women acting like they're fucking 12-year-olds, and Sophie's like, I keep trying, but you're not giving me anything. What do you want in return, Ryan? What do you want? I would give every cent I have if Ivy's plant finds would break down the door and murder these assholes so I don't have to listen to any more of this. And the vines actually do get in through the chimney and grab Sophie, but they don't instantly murder her like the guy from earlier, like Ivy said she was going to do, because the plot won't let her. So Sophie's fine. Luke sprays the vines with salt and vinegar, and the vines instantly retreat. Wow, that was so simple, it seems like something they really should have thought of before they entered the park, doesn't it? Luke says that plants can pick up sound vibrations, so all the noise they've been making drew Ivy right to them. Hey, uh, Luke, you know what else probably drew Ivy to you? The fact that she already knew where you were because she just chased you in there, you dumb son of a- Cut to Mary, who can feel poison ivy somewhere nearby. And Alice still thinks this is a terrible idea on account of poison ivy being a psychotic mass murderer. Takes one to know one, I guess. Mary thinks Alice is jealous. In what way, I'm not really sure. But Alice is just worried that Poison Ivy might do what Poison Ivy does and kill a bitch. Yeah. Alice had enough sense to be worried about that, but Renee Montoya didn't. 
that's where we are now. This situation has become so insane that Alice is the only one thinking clearly. But don't worry, I'm sure that's nothing a healthy dose of lesbianism can't fix. So Mary wonders why this little partnership of theirs has worked out so well, and realizes it's because that despite all their personal bullshit, all their history, they both found the sister they always wanted. And I have to say, as much as I despise this season with a burning passion, those little pot shots at Kate the producers keep throwing in there since Ruby Rose said the quiet part out loud bring warm feelings to my heart. So Mary says she loves that Alice supports her, but this is what she wants. So she mind controls Alice to stay put and she goes off to meet the OG. And yes, that is what they're calling her. Back in Montoya's office, Jada confesses that she's been afraid to treat Ryan like a daughter because the closer she gets, the closer Ryan comes to being a potential victim. But Dig advises her that if she just let her guard down, that thing she's so afraid of might just be the best thing that ever happened to her. All things considered, given how Jada's other kid turned out and Ryan being Ryan, I highly doubt that. And then Jada just finds the Joker's joy buzzer in an unlocked desk drawer. Even Montoya had that thing better secured than Team Batwoman did. Writers, my last brain cell is on life support here. For the love of God, how much more is there? Back in the park, Mary is confronted by Renee, who has broken free of Poison Ivy's mind control, just wait till you hear how she did that, and shoots Mary with a dart gun. A little while later, we see a camper and his young son hunting in the dead of night with no flashlights. Yeah, that sounds like a perfectly safe activity for a kid, doesn't it? Anyway, they happen upon an unconscious Mary. The dad checks to see if she's okay. Mary wakes up. He instantly points his gun at her for some reason. So she grabs him with plant vines and he gets whisked away into the darkness. And through the conversation with the son, we learn that this man is straight so you can probably guess what's happening to him off screen right now. Back at the cabin, they've used up all the salt, but there's another bag in the dead guy's truck, so Ryan has to suit up and go get the bag without making any noise that might alert Poison Ivy to their location, even though Poison Ivy already knows their location. So she manages to get the bag of salt, but then the little boy appears and yells for help, so here come the vines again. So Ryan dives into the truck, leaving the kid out there to die. The vines cover the truck, so Ryan tells Sophie over the comms to use the rifle in the cabin to blow the truck up. Now, this should be a really tense and dramatic moment. But remember, she's wearing the Batsuit, so we know it's all good. We've seen the Batsuit protect Batwoman from bombs multiple times. She'll be fine. Sophie's horrified by this because lesbianism, but she does finally take the shot. It's TV, so one shot is all it takes for the truck to blow like C4. Meanwhile, Luke runs out to protect the kid, the one person who was actually in real danger here, and the kid marvels that Luke saved him, even though he really didn't. The explosion clearly did not come anywhere near either of them. It looked Pretty laughable, actually. So Sophie finds Ryan, and sure enough, she's fine. Not even singed. But Sophie's pissed off anyway that Ryan almost died. She didn't, but the gates of lesbianism are about to open, so just go with it. They start arguing again, and Ryan finally vents all her emotional baggage, which ends with Sophie deciding that she's way too horny to listen to this anymore, and just kisses her. And then, Sophie leaves to go search for her car. For some reason, just assuming that Poison Ivy won't try to kill her again. And she doesn't. Because the episode is almost over? Who the hell knows? Later on, we're back at the graveyard where Luke is talking to his father's grave. I guess that's a theme this week or something. And what's weird about this is that he's talking like his dead dad and the Batwing suit's AI that sounds like his dad are the same person somehow. Which makes me think Luke might be very confused. He says he knows why Lucius doesn't think he's ready to be Batwing. And no, it's not because he was a barely college-aged 90-pound bookworm when Lucius died. It's because he's not even supposed to be here right now. He's supposed to be dead and only isn't because of a stupid, poorly written deus ex machina. Oops, I mean, uh freak miracle. But Luke is starting to think that all the horrible things that have happened to him recently have happened for a reason. Because the writers hate you for being a straight male? No. Well, 
Yes, that's a reason, but not the one Luke's talking about. He says he can't keep caring about what Lucius would think and won't let Lucius hold him back anymore because he's ready. And I don't know how they're going to resolve this issue of the Batwing suit failsafe malfunctioning. Best guess is they'll just forget about that now. Dig is there. He had Luke look into some kind of transmatter cube thing for him off screen. I assume that's Green Lantern related stuff, but I'm not watching the other shows, so beats me. Luke couldn't get the cube open, so to be continued on that. And Dick knows about Luke being on Team Batwoman, which he apparently found out about also off screen, because something meaningless like that didn't deserve its own scene or anything. Jesus Christ. So Dig asks Luke to tell Batwoman that Jada found a fix for Marcus, and then he leaves. What a f***ing waste of Dig this was. Cut to Alice waking up from Mary's brainwashing. She finds the kid's phone on the ground from the night before, which has a recording of the encounter with Mary, and then she finds the kid's dad impaled on a tree, dead. Mary murdered this man. Huh. And you know what? I like this. The huge waste of potential with the new Kate storyline in Season 2 was that Kate never did anything that she'd regret or be tormented by while she was brainwashed, so the whole thing was a complete waste. Weirdly enough, this Poison Mary plot is basically a repeat of that, only this time they're going all the way with it. Mary just killed someone, and on top of the simple guilt that comes with that, Mary's a doctor. She took an oath to do no harm. If and when she returns to normal, this is something that's going to haunt her. Or at least it would on a show that gave a rat's ass about itself and its characters. Now, realistically, will that happen? Probably not. More than likely, it'll be like when Kate killed a guy in season one. Mary will make a sad face about it for an episode or two, and then it'll just be swept under the rug and never mentioned again. And that's if Mary even feels any guilt about this at all, which is certainly not a guarantee. They might very well just play the card that she wasn't herself. She was poison Mary, which means it wasn't her fault. So... Bygones. But yeah, believe it or not, I actually like this development. I just have less than zero faith that they'll do anything good or interesting with it. And the episode ends with Montoya confronting Ivy again, telling her that this is a toxic relationship. Wow. What was your first clue, Renee? Was it the murders? I bet it was the murders, wasn't it? Also, the reason the mind control didn't work on her is because when Renee thought there was a chance that she might see Pam again, she created a toxin and ingested a drop a day, hoping that she might build up a tolerance to it. And that it wouldn't kill her, I guess. Question. Since when is Montoya a f***ing scientist? She created a toxin? Can you explain more, show? Montoya's not a botanist or a chemist or anything like that. She's a f***ing ex-cop, and not even a good one. But just like that, she just sciences a deus ex machina that makes her immune to Poison Ivy's powers, something that even Batman couldn't figure out? How? For God's sake, writers, I can't just use the plot says so graphic all the time. Eventually, people are gonna get sick of it. So now Ivy thinks Renee doesn't love her, and she does, just not the way Ivy wants. Fucking spare me. How is that the most important thing to take away from this? And Ivy says that it was only the thought of Renee that sustained her during those 10 years she spent with no water or sunlight or human contact and this raises two baffling points. One, that Ivy was somehow conscious during those 10 years, beats the crap out of me how that works, seeing as how she was a desiccated corpse at the time. And two, the writers are now telling us that lesbianism is more essential to human survival than water. Oh yeah, water, food, sunlight, who needs that shit when the human body can be sustained for a f***ing decade by the power of lesbianism alone? That is not how human biology works. F***ing hell. So Ivy says that Renee can walk away, but that doesn't mean she'll ever let Renee go. Then Mary shows up, and Renee knows what's about to happen here, and sure enough, she just stands aside and lets it happen. Good God. Paul Dini. Bruce Tim. Look what they did to your girl. Just... 
Just look. So Poison Ivy sucks all the plantosity out of Poison Mary and regains her full strength, I think. I still have no idea why this was necessary though, since Ivy was already powerful enough to easily move cars and topple oil rigs, so how weak could she possibly be? I guess we'll find out in the next episode, God help us all, but that's for next time. As for this episode, I'm f***ing done. I don't know what was more offensive here. Dig being completely wasted, Montoya's character being butchered beyond all recognition, or the absolute tragedy of what was done with Poison Ivy. The really frustrating thing about this is that Bridget Regan showed us in this episode what great casting this was. She makes the character seem interesting just with her performance. She comes off as cold and cruel and creepy. The material she's given is utter shit, but Regan is so talented she's able to elevate it just enough that it becomes really depressing because you can see how she could have been an awesome Poison Ivy if she just just had a halfway decent script to work with. Unfortunately, this is Batwoman, where finding a halfway decent script is like finding a f***ing unicorn. They're the stuff of myth. It just doesn't happen. Just like the concept of characters from the comics not getting treated like utter trash. What the hell have they done to Renee Montoya? I don't even recognize this person. Absolutely anything redeemable or even likable about the character is just gone like it never existed. And why? Because the only character trait the writers gave a shit about was gay, and that applies to Ivy too. Forget about her being a cop or a detective or the question with her own set of morals and principles and stuff, she's just gay female character number 9472 who compromises herself over and over and over again for the sake of her psychotic eco-terrorist mass murdering girlfriend because as far as the writers are concerned, lesbianism is more vital to human survival than f***ing water. Kiss my ass. And everything else was just as bad as usual. Luke's blaming himself for things that were literally everyone else's fault. Ryan and Sophie are acting like temperamental preteen idiots. The Marcus plot is getting more asinine by the minute. And that poor little kid getting traumatized for life by watching his dad get murdered right in front of him was one of the most blatantly mean-spirited things this show has ever done. F this episode. Four more episodes to go, guys. We're gonna get through this season together. Even if it kills me. Thanks for suffering through this shit with me. And while you're here, leave a comment, ding the bell icon, and follow my social media so you can always be notified when I upload new stuff. Links to all that and to my live streaming channel are down below. Thumbs up the video, share, subscribe, make sure you're still subscribed, and I'll be back with more soon. So stay tuned for that, do all the YouTube things, and I'll see you next time.